Welcome back everybody to your daily update on the state of the Malazan Empire. And I apologize for this not being a daily update because I was busy or something like it. Or just not able to make videos over the last couple of days. Anyway, here I am back and I finished The God is Not Willing and this is going to be about the last chapters and my final thoughts on the matter. So, I don't have that much light left. Um, let's get to it. Cheers. <sighs> Alright. So, I mean, like last time I talked about it, like feeling like a western and stuff like that. And now we're going to talk about the end game. That being, you know, chapters 18, 19, and what follows. And, um,. I feel like the first thing that is noticeable here is that, once again, Stuart Erickson is not afraid to raise the stakes immensely. Or not raise the stakes, but like reach a level of epicness or um, scale that you barely see in any other like fantasy novels on that level. I mean, this is like the first novel of a new series, a trilogy. And... Um, he just floods an entire country <laughs> and kills thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Which, yeah, as I said, it's, it's a level or like a, the scale is just like unique, almost unique in fantasy. And at least like in Western fantasy, I would say. Um, and the thing that I found interesting there is that it's very difficult to pull this off. And it almost fell a bit too much for me this time around, maybe because it's like the first novel when, you know, the end of the Malazan Book of the Fallen being incredibly, like, large scale with, you know, all the dragons and all that stuff. This is just the first, um, uh, like, novel and I felt that, like, the escalation was really steep here. I'm not sure how, how I feel about that all in all. I don't, I mean, it made sense within the story. It's, it's still left, you know, the idea is like, the question is like, how are you going to continue from here on? Like, how's that going to work out? <laughs> because, or at least if you follow your, you know, your average epic fantasy um, storyline through a trilogy. Now it may totally be that this will be a very very different story in whatever the next book will be called but so far that's like what left a lot of questions for me it's like <laughs> it's not that often that like the first book of a story has like wipes out entire people more or less so that's like a third thing that I found very fascinating about those last chapters. We also get like more of the, like how much times have changed between the end of the Malazan Book of the Fallen and the novels of the Malazan Empire and where we're at now. With something that has been, you know, kind of hinted at before that like almost every Marine is now a mage as well, at least a, a squad mage, cadre mage kind of level. Um, of mage and the amount of like slaughter they just you know inflict on the tablor is grueling it's like I mean yeah that's like that quote that history quote at the beginning of one of the chapters there that kind of makes that all clear but you know how <laughs> this is not one of the things that I or if, Think are so very very interesting about it. It's like you have that quote, that ep that epigraph at the beginning of a chapter about um, how the mage marine mage card um, legion was like a new thing under Emperor Malik Rel, and how it you know made the reliance on magic magic like more pronounced, but also made the whole thing more dangerous. And you're like, yeah interesting you have this like really dry historical analysis and then in the next chapter you just see them mow down entire like thousands of people and i think the important bit here is to look at the fact that when we read reports of warfare usually when you read the news or whatever or read history books they tend to sanitize um in a way or rationalize the facts of like violence and what warfare actually is. So what we get here with that 
dry historians um, quote at the beginning and then like the perspective and the toll it takes on those Malazan soldiers both physically to just wield that much magic but also to witness what they do with their like amount of magic how do they just like <laughs> kill those poor Teblor and other people that are just fleeing and we see how that like the, the mental the psychological damage that inflicts on themselves the toll that I is the more important aspect there and it's one of those things that we always need we do need to be aware always of the fact that even like the victorious parties in warfare in conflicts will take away a lot of damage a lot of trauma so there is that and we see a lot of that going on here Another thing that I mean, we need to talk about is um, Rand and um, God, I'm so bad with names. Um, uh, Bayroth Guild's daughter, um, Bake, or whatever her name is, Guild, obviously. And the um, the problem of child abuse um, with with um, Will Rand and the, the damage that kind of thing leaves with a child and how you how you treat with that and how you deal with that and it's a very like difficult scene I'm obviously not in the position to judge whether that is was done like well or not it felt tender in a way that I appreciated but it is a very very difficult theme or topic to write about it's not exactly something you expect to see a lot of happening like fantasy novels but then again we've read the Malazan book of the fall and we know that like heavy topics show up this is not this is not your your average YA novel this is like adult themed and serious themed in a lot of ways so we have that aspect there as well um, and, um, as I said, I felt it was handled in a good way in the fact that it is important to heal those trauma. Ta, in a way. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's what happens there. And I, once again, I feel, I feel it's done well. I hope my neighbor is actually going to park his bike there. All right. gods anyway um let's look at some more of the stuff that happens we look at the arrogance of the teblor the righteousness self-righteousness and arrogance of the teblor leader whose name is something theros i keep always fucking up names um we look at that and it's important to look at that because while his cause is just his cause and his goal is to lead his people away from the impending flood, to, um, you know, lead, yeah, first of all, to lead them away from that. His method is the only method he knows, which is warfare, granted, and that's something that we need to talk about later on as well. Is like, humans, whether they are Malazans or anyone else, Nathi or so, have not given the Teblor any. Um, you know, reasons to believe that they could find a way out <laughs> out and like a way of migration that will not have to be bought by violence. But on the other hand, we see his like self, his overconfidence. I mean, obviously, Teblor are huge, tough and whatnot. And we, when freeing all the slaves, he certainly had no problems to, you know, get all that stuff done and it has potentially um, further inflated his um, you know oh, I don't want to say ego but you know made him feel um, invulnerable in a way that is coming back to haunt him at a later point so 
that's what we see there because we come to the point where he does not li listen to scouts, not understand the problems that they raise because he doesn't actually think about his opponents. He just thinks of them as, and we have that word children again. He's like, yeah, we can just like <laughs> blast through them because they're small and weak. That's, that's not how it works. And he gets a large part of his force, force killed for that. Which is something that we, you know, see once again in like the Malazan and we need to talk about like the special um, role of the Malazans in um, the Malazan world later on as well. Like the idea that, you know, a just cause and pure strength make you a good war leader is highly problematic. On the other hand, we have someone like Rand, who is not yet a war leader, but who has <clears throat> whose goal, first and foremost, is that no one should die anymore. Which, in the long run, may just make for a way better, you know, approach. We, we need to talk about that in a couple of minutes, and even further. That whole idea of, like, the innocence or maybe not innocence of uh, Rand and what comes of it. <clears throat> Another thing that we need to talk about is, like, um, what happens after that, right? So the flood breaks and the Malazans um, help the Teblor sacrifice themselves to help the Teblor um, um, when all these, like, when, all, when the wave, that, that flood wave crashes over them and they die and, like, everyone dies because it's, like, too much power. <laughs> but at least they try until the end. And, um, this is something that I guess we've also seen before, the idea that, like, um, the, even though you might, you might fail at an impossible task, it is still important for our humanity to go and actually attempt those tasks. And, you know, rather die in the attempt than just, like, walk away and don't do it. Um, and we see that a lot here. The other thing that we see is understanding. We have that really moving scene when that like final Teblor like crawls to the berm of Silver Lake and Spindle talks to her and she's like just to burn the whole thing down and the Marines do that because like they understand the idea of how slavery how slavery like scars permanently scars um um its victims which is something that i don't have to point out to you how how much that is also <laughs> still of like like you know a lot of like value to understand current societal problems in our world in a way so yeah we see that and spindle does the right thing by you know burning down that place so there there's that We then see how Malazans and Teblor try to survive together in the face of this incredible natural disaster. How Jack and um, have hired Bulk's company to help them flee the the flooding because they once again don't believe that they have a chance to come through the Malazan Empire <laughs> on their own. And um, this, I guess, is where we need to talk about the big themes once again. And I, I've spoken about that like at the beginning, already at the beginning of the book. The idea of migration, of refugees, because of a dramatic change in the makeup of the world. And yes, you can read the entire book as a metaphor on how we, as humans, as decent human beings, should deal with refugees, possibly of something like climate change, for example, just tossing that out there. It goes for all kinds of refugees, but it also shows, like, points out in a rather direct way compared to some of, like, other themes that we see in Stephen Erickson's writing. Um, the, the, the need for basic humanity, basic compassion and empathy, which, you know, I've been there for for all the time, but we have that really clear at some point where it's, I think it's Spindle who says, like, or what empire would be worth 
fighting for that would turn away refugees. And, um, well, <laughs> we look at the world today, and we look at our, our, you know, more powerful nations in the global west or global northwest, we haven't done so well in that regard so far, and we'll have to do better in the future if we want to take any, like, you know, lesson from that. Like, we fuck up the planet, or even if we don't fuck up the planet, it is basic human decency to help fellow sentient beings, to help fellow beings. And this is like sort of the thing that we've seen at the end of the Malazan Book of the Fallen already. It's like, we have to work together. And yes, the other thing that we see here, and I appreciate the fact that it's done this way, is there were a lot of mistakes. You have all these Malazan soldiers like, if we had only known, it's like, yeah, you fucked up. You could have, like, asked. You could have, like, actually figured this out before that those people were actually migrating because of, like, some outside pressure. Instead, a lot of lives were lost. A lot of trauma was incurred because we didn't think about it too much. Which, once again, let this be a warning to all of us. It's like, if, like, these, like, huge movements happen, like, usually they happen for a reason. And... um it will be well worth to find out those reasons every single time. So yeah, we leave the the book ends with the attempts of rebuilding, reorganizing, repurposing, and um, you, know, you know making a way through that really like extremely changed new world that we'll find at the end of The God is Not Willing. And I, for one, have, like, no idea how this is going to continue in the next book. So I'm very, very excited to find that out. And, um... What else? The end? I don't know. Um, there's more, obviously, to it. We have more of... We need to talk a bit more about, you know, general things now, because those are, like, sort of the themes in the last like chapters I would say once again like the inevitability of that flood the sheer immense power that is you know something that we can't deal with as human beings or like that no one in that like thing could deal with that then we need to talk about the rant war bitch thing and yeah I called it wrong like I didn't you know correct it yet like war bitch is just a daughter of Tog and Fandere, so that's cool. Um, but we need to talk about the idea that um, in some way, with the help of his uh, Chigal assassin knife, Rand ca could, you know, travel backwards in time or however that works and gather up all that um, lost rage and, and all that energy of all those children, all the pain, and give it as energy to war bitch for her to change, um, to change history in a way. And, um, now I have, like, one thought on, like, why this might work, that once again would be Rance in a sense. Like, look, wishing that we could change the past is something that we that most of us do a lot but most of us as grown up grown ups with a you know certain level of cynicism that we unfortunately have we know that that's not possible because we know that there's like physical limitations and all that stuff but um for someone who has not yet like settled into that I don't know how to call it properly, but, you know, who hasn't yet settled into that, like, tight hardness of reality. Maybe it is possible. So, I, I that's, like, the only way I can, like, sort of uh, feel that. Of, of course, I mean, he has, like, also, like, a God's blood in himself, so that, that, that probably helped. But, yeah, I find this highly interesting. And one thing that I find very interesting here is um, the idea of, like, the responsibility of, like, the worshipped and how that might work. 
We see that with Warbitch, who is trying to, you know, do her thing to save her people and so forth. And then we see it with Grant, who is trying to do his best, even though he doesn't have people yet. Because this is the important thing, is Grant doesn't, you know, differentiate between humans, Tevlor, Jack, or anything. He's like, no more pain, no more killing. Which is... Once again, he's like, very, very human for that, like, you know, malazan value of human. <laughs> he's very much a person in that regard, or very close to the ideal person, in that he understands the... the, the basic and general value of um, compassion and empathy or tries to avoid suffering for any possible person which yes is makes him so so incredible as a character so incredibly fascinating to me in a way because um, yeah we are like used to rather jaded characters I guess um, in a lot of like our jaded fiction and there was once again like um, a long discussion on the cynic and how the cynic is you know destroying the world through his cynicism at <laughs> near the end of the book which I don't want to say it's a direct answer to the whole like grimdark debate but I could you could read it as such cynicism is a huge problem um, for each and all of us and I, I fall into the cynicism a lot I guess most of us do these days but it is vital to know uh, to recognize the fact that like retreating into cynicism is very much like giving up and we can't do that if we want to change if uh, we can't want do that if we want to you know change the world which we should want because the world is a fucked up place and it's getting fucked up and more fucked up by the minute mostly <laughs> so we we need to leave that cynicism that well-worn cynicism behind if we want to you know hope that the future will be better so yeah overall things i once again feel that the whole like, <laughs> refugees of climate change, oh, if you want to read it that way, theme is, compared to, like, earlier writings in the Malazan Book of the Fallen, this feels way more urgent, which, you know, I can understand. It's like, the times have changed. We should be way more aware of that. It's, it's a bit more overt, in a way. And it kind of went almost to the limits of what I want to you know uh, I don't know how to sp how to actually explain that it was like almost a bit too overt for my personal tastes but I I recognize the necessity for that because you know if you're too subtle with those kind of things most people will just overlook it so yeah I get it and I appreciate it. The next thing is, once again, the ideal, the, the Malazan Marine, not the Malazan Empire in general, but the Malazan Marine as something of the ideal human, in a way, recognizing, recognizing their responsibility that comes with the power they have, because they are obviously more powerful than the average person. And recognizing the human responsibilities, not like, you know, the responsibilities of like, um, that come with a role, but it's like the general idea that if you are a person with more power than the average person, that like settles to you with the responsibility to be a better person in general. So that's something that came across a lot, I felt, especially near the end. It's like, you don't do that, you give up your basic humanity. And then all the other stuff you have, all the privileges you have, are worthless. So um, there's that. It's way more powerful. I felt it was like way more direct. I guess in, a lot of things felt a lot more direct in this book compared to most of the other Malazan writings that I've read so far. With maybe, um, you know, the potential critique, uh, criticism of um, consumer capitalism in something that we'll see in like Midnight Times. But apart from that, this is like some of the most direct, like... Um, themes that I've seen so far from Steven Erickson. I personally like that. I personally appreciate that. I'm a direct person. I I do appreciate books that have a message. 
A lot of other things are interesting, though. <laughs> the way that now the heavies in the marine banter, which was cool, the way that the heavies are now <laughs> subverting older, like, heavy tropes, and, like, when we think back to how the heavies are portrayed in the Malazan Book of the Fallen as, like, these, oftentimes, they, like, over-the-top um, stupidity, almost. <laughs> now we have people like Follibor and Blanket with their, like, over-the-top um, elaborate discussions which are still you know not saying that much but you know I found it as an interesting point that you can basically subvert the expectations of your readers within that very specific world and cosmos you built up before like you have we have that basic Malazan cosmos built up by Esselund and Ericsson with all the stuff that you have in there, like, you know, Happy's being that way, Sapper's being all mad and crazy, and all of that, and now we go to the new, this new book, The God is Unwilling, and suddenly those expectations, almost tropes within the Malazan world, are being subverted and changed again, and I, I appreciate that, which, you know, kind of makes you always question tropes in general, it's like, maybe they're all just, you know, they're shifting all the time. Another thing that I find very interesting is the character of Bulk. <laughs> I can't wait to see what becomes of him in the future. He seems to be kind of honorable, um, even though he has obviously um, a grudge against the Malazan Empire, a more or less reasonable grudge, I'll give him that. Although he seems to, you know, a lot of that seems to be about him losing his privileges and... Um, <laughs> All of that but i felt like the character was underused so i'm hoping that we'll see more of bulk in the next novel seeing where he you know which way he can actually develop and become which way he's actually going in the end does he recognize the like good sides of the malazan empire it's honesty the way it takes responsibility for things or will he you know by accident or not by accident um see the darker sides of once again colonialism and conquest and become more of an like an enemy or an adversary to the Malazan Empire than he's than he already is that's something that I am tr you know dying to find out um another thing that I found very fascinating is the character of Stillwater and her like impossibility or like incapability of recognize of like recognizing stuff like irony and things like that on the other hand we learn in that last part in like first of all she does the right thing when it's necessarily you know saving children and so forth we also learn that apparently she studied law and was like a lawyer and is noble born and everything like that but she left all of that behind because she wanted things more simple and clean cut and all of that It'll be interesting to see in which way her character will evolve in the future. I'm just, you know, just saying. I, could be good, could be really terrible as well. I also really appreciate the way we see that slowly evolving relationship between Bliss Raleigh and um, Spindle. Um, once again, I've said it before, Steven Erickson is really good at you know, creating relationships of um, older people. <laughs> and Spindle as a character in general is a very, very fascinating character to see how he has at the end of this book decided that maybe it's time for him to actually retire and go back to um, the Resistance to link up with whoever is left there. <laughs> Might be interesting, although <clears throat> I find it kind of interesting that he they are that he's still like kind of on the like are they retired are they the like, deserters or not kind of thing as someone who was there and then re-enlisted in a way that there's like no clarity on that question still no clarity on the question which i find interesting but we'll see how that goes in the future um what else I um, didn't really appreciate the dynamic between Gaur and Nilgan as those two Jack. Especially Nilgan is a super fascinating character. He kind of reminded me a bit 
of um, this is going to be like a one of those things that I shouldn't say proudly. But if you've ever read um, Farmer Giles of Ham, one of those short stories by J.R.R. Tolkien, there's a dog in there called Garm. Nilligan reminds me a lot of like, like a lot of bluster when it's possible, but very much uh, very easy to actually cow and not, you know, and sh and you know slink away as soon as it's actually. I think it's really tough. Really fascinating character. It'll be interesting to see where that whole thing is going. In general, I appreciate the way that Jack are portrayed this time round compared to what we see in Midnight Tides. <coughs> That's just good. Um, so, yeah. Overall, I mean, I'm not like a reviewer. This is not a review. I would say I enjoyed the book. It was a very fast, easy read compared to um, the Malazan Book of the Fallen stuff. I a lot of it, you know, there's a lot of action, especially in the la last part of the of the book. It you know worked well on that level. I guess I missed a ton of themes and interesting interconnections to all kinds of things. So there's that. I'll definitely go and reread it. <laughs> and then I'll pick up more things, I hope, and I think. But for the first time around it was yeah, it was a it was a fun read. It was a, a relatively quick and fun read, which has nothing to do with like the relative shortness of the book, like relative for like a Steven Erickson novel. I just felt maybe by making its points a bit clearer than some of the older Malazan of the Book of the Fallen novels, it made it kind of easier to read, plus, you know, a lot of, like, really cool marine banter, plus very direct action, a lot of direct action helped a lot with that as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. And now I'll guess um, the future will be me going back to uh, reading Fall of Light in the next couple of days. I'll start on that one. Maybe this week, maybe on Monday. We'll see how that goes. Until then, I have like other stuff. I really still want to talk about um, Shadows Linger, that second Black Company novel I just finished a couple of days ago. There's more more coming. And until then, um, yeah. Hope you have a great week, and I'll talk to you real soon. Cheers.